one of history's most notorious figures of war, a senior officer of the British Army and an integral figure of the First World War. As commander of the British Expeditionary Force from 1915 to the end of the conflict in 1918, Sir Douglas Haig led the British forces to success. But at what cost? One million casualties, to be exact. In the years following, Haig's esteemed figure has not been remembered fondly. Welcome to Bizarre History. Today we'll be looking at the dispute and anger behind the leadership of Sir Douglas Haig. Haig was educated at the esteemed British Military Academy, Sandhurst. He was noted to have cultivated pride in presenting himself as the most upstanding of gentlemen. His formative years are of a committed, wealthy, and educated young man working his way up the British military establishment. In 1885, he joined the Cavalry Regiment of the Queen's 7th Hussars and was in expeditions to Sudan and India. The membership into the Hussars is a huge touchstone to understanding the entire story of Sir Douglas Haig. All traits of debate about him are littered throughout his time serving. Symbolically, the Queen's 7th Hussars were one of the oldest regiments in the entire British Army, embedded with traditions of gentlemen and upholding cavalry as the most dynamic force in combat. Yet, it is in 1889 when Islamic forces in Sudan caused unrest to British occupation that Haig would have first-hand witness of technological advances in warfare and their awesome capabilities. It's believed a British and Egyptian force wiped out a Mudai insurgency three times the size of it, all due to their technology being more advanced. Along with Kitchener and Churchill, these distant British Empire military conflicts made the name of many soldiers and military men. Following these expeditions, Haig went on to different positions in command of the forces, and in 1904, became the youngest ever Major General of the British Army. These formative years are telling of the man and of his time. The arrival of the 20th century brought a technological advancement and eclipse. Many questioned what place cavalry had in warfare. What use was charging with sabers and rapiers in a landscape gravitating steadily to regular gunfire? In spite of Haig witnessing this firsthand, he is perhaps the most renowned traditionalist of the entire debate. He is even supposed to have stuck a stubborn figure favoring traditional war methods in opposition to Prime Minister Lloyd George. It's this rigidity of the past that's the making of his reputational downfall. Unfortunately for Haig and for many of the British soldiers he was commanding, the new technology arriving at the start of the century changed the entire landscape of warfare. Previous wars only decades back had been very much the cavalry-based combat scenarios. The war promised at the approach of the First World War was that of trenches, machine guns, even the formative start of tanks. Those ordering troops over giant maps had no real concept of how horseback and regimented charges versus artillery was a humanitarian disaster in waiting. It's in this clash of old world versus new world, tradition versus new wave, that World War I racked up casualties higher than ever seen before. This clash led to the patriotism of supporting the nation's war effort, lost traction in a hold as strong as the British Empire. War poets decrying the senseless waste of such high casualty war became part of the national psyche. It's understood that Britain was using modernized warfare and its technologies come 1918. But for a majority of the war effort, they didn't, to the cost of millions of lives. This is the basis for the post-war declaration of lions led by donkeys. The saying has been disputed as something found in actual memoirs between German soldiers or not. However, its sentiment has stuck ever since. The clueless strategy of World War I generals left them derided as donkeys, and those being led to unnecessary slaughter characterized as lions for their bravery. Haig's story is one that utterly fits this damning characterization. He continually delivered on his vision and demands to win the war as he saw it. 
Blindly following tradition, Haig set up the British Expeditionary Force with a much disputed and high expenditure on cavalry units. He has been consistently characterized as a remarkably bullheaded general, somehow undeterred by wisdom others lacked. He was one of few who predicted the war would not be over in a matter of months. Field Marshal Haig's quest for big victories, his disregard for any battlefield or weather conditions, as well as preferring cavalry over artillery, were remarkably costly for the British. This is found most devastatingly in the Somme. It's hard to know where to begin with outlining the Somme. It is comfortably one of the darkest days in human history. It's also the definite marking point of the cost of using old war traditions against the coming technology. The result of this in literary and artistic reflection of the Somme is clear, hell. All roads lead to hell. All artworks and paintings are barren, dark landscapes decorated with dead bodies. This, when not depicting dying bodies piled up on one another in trenches of eerie cavernous depth, war poets to a young Adolf Hitler specifically use the word hell as a descriptor. Wounded in his campaign and attendance, Hitler actually compared the Somme to hell as opposed to war. Yeah, and that was Hitler's assessment. The real-time cost of the Somme was over one million casualties, and disturbingly, a man killed every 4.4 seconds. Sir Douglas Haig was the commander in charge of British forces and was hugely responsible for one of the worst score draws ever accomplished. Quite tragically, the British effort at the Somme was mainly filled out by wartime volunteers and their first day of combat left the largest single day of casualties in British military history, approaching 60,000. Yet Haig was on the search for big victories. He believed the Allies could break through and little gains were being made. Despite record-breaking casualties, Haig brought reinforcements, thousands upon thousands of British soldiers over the top of the trenches into a wasteland of barbed wire, dead bodies, and artillery shelling. It's understood, so detached were those commanding the operation, some soldiers were ordered to physically march over the top behind their commanding officer, a sickening embodiment of following tradition in the face of certain death. What was meant to be a brief campaign that brought Allied results went on for four months, claimed no victor, and left a stain visible to this day. Despite being interlaced with staged footage, the documentary The Battle of the Somme was screened in Britain, showing footage of the conflict. The propaganda effort raised as much shock as it did morale, particularly in the face of casualty records released to the British public. So hellish was the Somme, its mudscape of death proved too much for tanks, regularly breaking down the Mark I, being debuted by the Allies. The futility of the Somme showed Haig's traditionalist Achilles heel to the extreme, not making any ground on previously championed gains, finding no big victory, all while sending thousands of young men to hell. It's fair to say that between Churchill, Kitchener, and Haig, the last remnants of the British Empire's military campaigns are personified. Haig is as big a figure as the other two militarily speaking. He is remembered as the British commander of World War I, but the cost of his tactics remains the eternal talking point. Black Adder, the popular British comedy show, always characterized Haig and his command as utterly incompetent and oblivious to the cost. Haig's post-war efforts show otherwise. His post-war life was consistently dedicated to the welfare of ex-military personnel. He lobbied on their behalf, and despite being a quiet and introverted soul by most accounts, he was willing to take on public speaking to do so. He set up a foundation dedicated to the funding of servicemen's health, and even set up homes for ex-servicemen after the Great War. It's hard to know looking in retrospect whether this was done with a sense of obligation or guilt on Haig's behalf, but he clearly didn't deny the cost of the war he'd been running. 
Furthermore, it's fair to imagine those dominating the globe for the past century as British military commanders had might just consider themselves more equipped than any advisors. Would any British commander coming out of a so-called imperial century for Britain really trust new technology over uniformly winning ways? Would any field marshal facing the new introduction of gas bombs, air bombs, mounted machine guns and tanks look all that great sending men into this? In any case, Haig was the commander in charge and post-war Britain wasn't kind, labeling him Butcher Haig after the Somme. There is argument that it's the monumental human cost of World War I that puts its generals under such harsh review, not so much their actions. The Hundred Days Offense was an expedition led by Haig that ended with the end of World War I, a staggering achievement. Haig also commanded this with a smaller army than his German opposition, yet it is the casualties that come to the forefront. Despite being outgunned and outnumbered, Haig's forces pulled through to astounding results and success, but at the cost of 3,654 casualties per day, which was even more than the daily cost of the Somme. In essence, the only possible defense of Field Marshal Haig's leadership is that it wasn't on him, but on machine technology arriving in warfare. Arguably, the casualty rate of World War I was inevitable, irrespective of its leadership at the time. So, is Sir Douglas Haig a controversial figure, or just an institutional victim of bringing the machine to the gun? If you want more of history's most divisive and decisive figures, be sure to subscribe, like, and hit that notification bell. As always, thanks for watching Bizarre History. See you next time.